Hey, welcome to another weekend message. I'm Bill Thomas, pastor at Hereford Faith and Life Church. I'm so happy that you are joining us uh, to open up God's Word and to pray and to learn as we are in this uh, series uh, under new management. But before we do that, I want to remind you uh, that this weekend uh, we are celebrating communion. So if you don't already, you may want to just pause this, uh, get your elements ready, uh, especially if you've got a family watching with somebody else. At the end of this message, we will take communion together and I'll bless these elements and we'll do that. All right, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love and your mercy, your protection. Lord, we are so so grateful for everything you do for us. We are so, so thankful. And Lord, our hearts go out to the people in Florida and the Southeast uh, as Hurricane Ian is just devastating many, many, many lives. And there's been loss of life. There's been loss of property and uh, jobs. And just, uh, again, we pray that your church, us, the body of Christ, would rise up and reach out your hands of love and help and so we, we do pray for them. We thank you, God. Pray, Holy Spirit, you would guide us and teach us uh, during this message. And we ask all this in the precious, mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You know, I was thinking, you know, praying that the mighty name of Jesus, that's a whole nother message, isn't it? The Bible says that at his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And uh, I want to do it now while I'm alive. Follow him as my Lord and Savior. I don't want to be forced to do that. That's for those who've rejected Christ. So if you haven't given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, do it now. What, what are you waiting for? It's the greatest life. It's the abundant life. And it's eternal life with him. Well, let me share screen as we start this message. I want to talk about the incredible, incredible wonders uh, of the human body. You know, God fashioned us. And it is incredible. Listen to these details. The human brain can store 100 trillion facts. As I get older, I think that number is shrinking, but uh, we can handle 15,000 decisions a second in our brain, which I guess then uh, our wives have no excuse when they uh, say, what do I... I don't have anything to wear. What should I wear out of my closet? 15,000 decisions a second. Do you know your nose can smell up to 10,000 different odors? The nerves in your fingers can detect an item one twenty-five thousandth of an inch. That's incredible. And your tongue can taste one part of quinine in two million parts of water. We are just incredibly made. In fact, let's read this Psalm 139. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. Listen, God made you. He designed you, created you. And listen, you're a real work. You're a real piece of work. You are a masterpiece. And as marvelous and stupendous as our technology has advanced, it doesn't even come close to the complexities and the capabilities and the design of the human body, the body that God created. You are wonderfully complex, designed and created by the greatest engineer in the whole universe who watched you personally, shaped you in your mother's womb. God saw you. He knew you. He designed you. There in your mother's womb. And are you ready for this? God designed you for a special purpose in this world. God charted out a path and destiny for your life before a single day had passed. And not only were you on God's mind, he was shaping you in the womb. He, even now, God thinks about you all the time. No one could measure how often God thinks about you, that you're on his heart more than the grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. Now, when I was an art student and then later an art teacher, part of the curriculum had to do with sculpting and clay. 
Uh, we molded and shaped things, and we even got on a potter's wheel to form, uh, uh, you know, sculptures and, and, and shapes. And I, I know what it's like to shape clay. And we've all probably done that with this miracle substance called Play-Doh. Do you remember that? Uh, I know some of you ate it. I know that. But we were supposed to shape it and form it into pieces of art. Well, the Bible teaches us that God shaped you and me. We are being formed and designed for a distinct purpose in his kingdom. And it's why you are the way you are, physically and emotionally. And that's why God can use you the way you are. In Job chapter 10, 8, he says, your hands shaped me and made me. God did that for you and for me. So let's look at your shape because each one of us has a unique shape. And we're going to use our friend's model, Rick Warren, who taught us during our two-year COVID experience. We did three 50-day programs with Pastor Rick written by him. So let's take a look at our shape. And that's an acronym. S, S stands for spiritual gifts. The book of Ephesians says he, that's God, has given each one of us a special gift according to the generosity of Christ. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you came under new management. You're no longer the boss of your life. You don't call the shots. Everything is God's. And you're a manager and steward of what God has entrusted to you. And everybody who's given their lives to Jesus Christ has been given at least one spiritual gift. And really, most people have several. Your spiritual gift is a supernatural ability deposited in you and in your life through the Holy Spirit to enable you to do what God has uniquely designed you to do. A spiritual gift uh, is not a natural talent. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It's not acquired by skills and training. Now, there are many spiritual gifts discussed in the Bible. They're all gifts of God's grace. We don't earn them. Uh, we, there's nothing we do to, to, to get them. It's just God who deposits them in our life to enable us to serve his purposes and power with power and effectiveness. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11 talks about some of these gifts. Now, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but it's the same Holy Spirit who's the source of them all. And that's really important. We all have different spiritual gifts, but it's the Holy Spirit who deposits them in our life. He goes on to say a spiritual gift is given to us as a means of helping the entire church. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, gives a gift of special knowledge. The Spirit gives special faith to another. And to someone else, he gives the power to heal the sick. He gives one person the power to perform miracles. Another, the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to know whether it's really the Spirit of God or not. That's called the discerning of spirits. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages. Another is given the ability to interpret what's being said. It's the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes these gifts. And he alone decides which gift each person should have. Now, that's fascinating. And, and listen, I think it's kind of like God will give you the gift you need at the moment you need it. But there are those who have a track record in these gifts. Now, there's many other passages with other spiritual gifts not listed here. For instance, there's the gift of administration. Someone can just walk into a chaotic office or situation and just put it back together. There's the gift of helps, the gift of mercy, gifts of leadership, of faith, of hospitality. And the list continues. As disciples, listen, we're to do all those things, but they take work and discipline. However, there will be those with spiritual gifts who are divinely gifted and empowered to do what they do with incredible effectiveness and fruitfulness. For instance, we're all mandated to share our faith. We're all called to go into all the world, make disciples, but not everybody has the gift of evangelism. Years ago, one of my associate pastors and friend had that gift. Uh, he could walk into a group and talk very naturally and comfortably to anybody strangers to everybody about Jesus Christ, often, often leading them to make a decision for Christ right there in the spot. In fact, one time he led a guy to make a decision for Christ while in the men's room. Sharing Christ just came supernaturally natural to him. And that's how our spiritual gifts work. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you know your spiritual gift? If not, you better discover it because you have one. And there are lots and lots of books 
teachings and surveys that you can uh, chart out your spiritual gift, you know, ask God, God, show me what is my spiritual gift? Ask the people around you who know you best. I bet they know what it is. For instance, one of my spiritual gifts is teaching. God has given me an ability to look at facts and rearrange them and share them in ways that make sense. Now, I've worked hard and continue to work hard. I read a lot. I, I study uh, teachers and preachers because I want to be a better teacher, but it didn't come naturally to me. It, it came supernaturally. Now, note this important truth. The purpose of your spiritual gift is not for your benefit. Let me say that again. It's not for your benefit. It's for the benefit of others as you do what God designed and purposed you to do. Remember what Paul wrote in Corinthians is a spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping the entire church, not just you. So S stands for your shape, your spiritual gifts. H stands for your heart. Heart is all about passion. God has designed each of us with a passion for something, a passion for people, a passion for the lost, a passion for the hungry, the needy, a passion for teaching kids, a passion for the environment, a passion for animals. Your heart is the very source of all motivations. What you love to do and what you care about the most is really probably your passion. Your passion is what gets you up in the morning. The Bible uses this phrase over and over again. We're to serve the Lord with all our heart. Here in Joshua 22, verse 5, the Lord says to Joshua, carefully follow the commands and teachings that the Lord's servant Moses gave you. Love the Lord your God, follow his directions, keep his commands, be loyal to him, and serve him with what? With passion, with all your heart. And there's a reason why you have a heart and a passion for certain things, because God designed you that way for his purposes, for his glory. You know, I found that people rarely excel at tasks they don't enjoy or feel passionate about. In fact, people say all the time, hey, my heart was just not in it. Well, what is your heart into? That heart, that passion is there because God put it there. Do you love coaching kids? Do you love working on computers and technology and software? Do you love working with the poorest of the poor? That love came from God. It's a passion he deposited in you. Well, how do you know when you're serving God from your heart? Well, the first sign is enthusiasm. <laughs> you're excited about what you're doing. No one can has to motivate you or check up on you. You're, you're not doing it for applause or for payment, though you might be getting paid, but you're not doing it for the money. You just love it. And nothing, nothing will discourage you. So that's S is your spiritual gifts. H, your heart. A is your abilities. Now, these are the natural abilities and talents I talked about earlier that you're born with. Music, mathematics, sports, mechanics, art. Your abilities and talents are from God. And they're just as important as your spiritual gifts. But the real difference is that you are given your abilities and talents at birth. You're given your spiritual gift when you're born again and give your heart and life to Jesus. Your spiritual gifts were entrusted to you at the second birth. Abilities is what God gave you when you were born and designed you to have. Now, here's something maybe you didn't know. Every ability God has given to you can be used for God's glory. Every ability. You're a mechanic. Hey, you can be helping single moms with kids fix their old beat-up cars. Are you an IT person? You know internet and technology and software? You might be helping a senior saint use the internet or set up an iPhone. Every talent and gift God has given to you can be used for his glory. Now, hear this announcement. God has a place in his church where your abilities and talents can shine and you can make a difference. And it's up to you to find that place. God has a place for you in this church, the church you attend, your church, where you will and can make a difference and touch people's lives. Now, God gives some people the ability to make a lot of money. Why? To build big houses, make big deals, making prop No, to accumulate wealth and become generous, extravagant givers. So it's not to spend it on yourself. It's I give some people the ability just to, to make a lot of money, and it's for giving. It's for God's glory. 
The Bible says, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. We were given our abilities and talents with the same purpose as our spiritual gifts, to serve God by serving others. If God has not given you the ability to carry a tune, then God isn't going to expect you to be an opera singer or lead vocalist for a worship team or choir. God will not ask you to dedicate your life to something you have no talent or ability for. On the other hand, your abilities and talents are a strong indication of what God wants you to do with your life. They're clues for discovering God's will for you. And get this, please. Your gifts and abilities were not given to you just to make a living. God gave them to you for your ministry, for serving Christ by serving others. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, or chapter 4, verse 10. God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other passing on to others God's many kinds of blessings. Coaching, art, preparing meals, repairing cars to give away, landscaping, writing curriculum, providing health care, administration, helping others. Whatever you are good at, you should be doing for your church. I remember a church I was serving. We had lots and lots of teachers and administrators and helpers, but our Sunday school was struggling. I remember calling a meeting of all of my educators, and we had a good group there, and I challenged them. I said, people, we should have the best Sunday school in the county. Look at all the teachers we have, and administrators and helpers, because your gifts and talents were made to serve God and his people. Some people responded, I don't want to, I do that all week long. Why would I do it on Sunday? Because that's how God designed you. Your abilities primarily are for his glory and, and for the church. And it's great when we get to use them in other employment, particularly uh, employment where we can make a living. But your career and the abilities and talents you have every day at work were also meant for here in the church. The church is important. Next comes P. P stands for personality. I love this. God created us with unique combinations of personality traits. Would you say amen to that? God made introverts. He made extroverts. Uh, I would love to see a show of hands. How many of you are listening and watching that are extroverts? And um, I would ask introverts to raise your hand, but you probably wouldn't want to raise your hand because people might look at you. You're introverted. God's made some people who love routine and order. Others who just love variety and spontaneity. Some are thinkers. Others are feelers. Some work best alone. Some thrive in groups. Some are sanguine, others are choleric, some are melancholy. There's no right or wrong personality or temperament for ministry. Let me say it again. There's no right or wrong personality or temperament for ministry. God uses them all. Now, introverts usually don't make the best greeters, so that might not be the right place, but they can be powerful intercessors and prayer warriors, counselors one-on-one. -on -one. Your personality will affect how and where you use your spiritual gifts and natural abilities. You might not believe this, but I'm an introvert. Being with people often drains the life out of me. <laughs> and what you see in me, particularly Sunday mornings, is, is it's, it's God's grace and me being obedient to my calling and the love that God has put in my heart for you, my church family. The Bible says that God works through different people in different way, ways, but it is all the same God who achieves his purpose through them all. I think that's important for us to see. God wants us to find our fit so we can effectively serve him the way he designed and shaped us to be and made us. Finally, E stands for your experiences, your life experiences. You know, no one has experienced life the way you have. Every one of us has been shaped by our growing up, by our experiences, by our families, by our friends. Most of these experiences were beyond our control. God allowed them for the purpose of shaping us so we can be used by him. He's given each of us unique experiences. Family, education, vocational experience, spiritual experience, ministry, sorrow, pain, struggle. We've all had painful experiences. This is one God tends to use the most to prepare us for service. Do you know what? God never wastes a hurt. Your greatest ministry will most likely come out of your greatest hurts. God allows you and me to go through painful experiences to equip us 
to minister and share with others. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 4, it says, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When others are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. So why did God give you your shape? To serve God and others. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, read it with me. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God designed you to make a difference with your life. You weren't created just to take up space, to, 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 but you're created to make a contribution, to glorify God and to serve and minister to others in the kingdom of God. There's an old Danish proverb. It says, what you are is God's gift to you, but what you do with your life is your gift to God. Now, we get an idea about our shape. And, and, and again, I want to say this, that this shape is not for ourselves. When you became a Christian and you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you gave up ownership of your life and you're now under new management. Jesus is your CEO calling all the shots. And you and the uniqueness of how God designed you, your shape comes into clarity when you discover that you were shaped to serve God by serving others. You were shaped to serve God by serving others. Now, let me talk a little bit briefly about here the, the common reasons and excuses why we don't manage our shape and and serve God and, and others the way we should. Here's a first, here's a big one. I don't have anything to offer. I hear people say all the time, I have no real gifts or abilities. I'm not good at anything. Stop. Please listen to this message again when you're done. Listen to it a couple times if that's how you're feeling. It's just not true. God doesn't make junk. He doesn't design things that don't work or can't be used. God can use everybody. Because he designed every person, shaped every one of us so we can be used by him to touch others and bring him glory. It's not about your gifts and talents. You have them. Here's what it is. It's about you making yourself available so God can use you. Many times I've heard this statement, God doesn't call the equipped. God equips the call. And friend, you've been called to serve him by serving others. You have everything you need to do what God designed you to do. God made you, he shaped you for his use, but you have to believe that by making yourself available. You need to say, here I am, Lord, use me. One of my heroes in the faith, he's gone home to be the Lord, was John Wimber. He uh, worked in the 60s with a duo you might have heard called the Righteous Brothers. He gave his life to Christ and left the music industry and God used him to found a movement of churches that now has circled the globe called the Vineyard. And John would often say, Lord, I'm only change in your pocket, but you can spend me any way you want. In other words, I may not have a lot to offer, but I'm available. Use me. Listen, God loves that kind of heart and attitude. The second excuse we often hear is, well, I'm not as talented as gifted or gifted as, well, fill in the name. And this happens when we compare ourselves with others. I know that from personal experience. But comparing our shape with others stops many people from really serving God. Well, if only I could sing like Jenny or Lauren or Janine or, or David or Mark or, or Hunter or, or Lynn, or, or I, I, you know, I'd be on the worship team. <laughs> well, if I could just teach like Jen or, or Jan or any of the teacher's helpers, I, I'd be helping in the King's Quest. Or, or if I could just preach like Bill, well... I think I can put people to sleep as well as he does. Well, <laughs> you get my point, people. Every one of you, God didn't design you and create you and give you your shape to be like somebody else. He made you to be you. And God's desire is for you to become the best version of you that you can be. Discover your shape and use it for God's glory in serving others. And when you stand before God on that great glorious day, listen, God's not going to ask you, why weren't you more like Billy Graham? Why weren't you more like Sister Teresa? Why weren't you more like Mark Gardner, our lay leader, does so many things? Why God's going to say, why weren't you more like you? 
the you I created and designed and shaped you to be. The best you that you can be. Don't compare your shape to other people's shapes. And this is the most powerful one, I think, of all. But I'm not worthy to be used by God. Bill, you just don't know my past and how many times I've fallen and failed, and even my struggles now, but just trying to pray a little bit each day. I don't deserve for God to use me. Folks, none of us deserve anything from God, not even our salvation. There's not a single one of us that deserves even one single blessing from God. It's all God's grace, God's amazing grace poured out at the cross through Jesus Christ. And God's grace is unmerited. It's unearned. It's undeserved. It's just his love, love that dies for us while we were yet sinners, love that calls us to God even when we're bent on living life our own way. Love that forgives our sins and chooses to remember them no more. Love that gives us heaven when we deserve hell. Love that places us in ministry and service to others as the hands and feet of Christ, not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, because it can't be earned, but simply because of God's grace and how much he loves us. So let's add this to what we've learned these past weeks. We manage and steward the power of God through prayer. We commit to support this church with our prayers. We manage and steward the time and trust to us through our presence. That is, we commit to support this church by being here, attending faithfully. We manage and steward the wealth and finances that God entrusts to us through giving. We commit to support this church through generous, extravagant, joyous, proportionate giving, the time. And then we manage and steward the very life God has designed and shaped and created us to be by using our shape effectively and fruitfully to serve God by serving others. That's why when we commit to be a part of this church, we pledge our support with our prayers, our presence, gifts, and catch this, our service. We will use our shape to serve God by serving others here in our church and all others outside our campus. Well, I found that one of the tricks to do that is you've got to clean your spiritual glasses. We've got to begin seeing other people as God sees them with deep needs, with deep hurts and wants. And when we need to pray this simple prayer, Lord, when I see the needs of others around me, move me to action. Remember, it's just about making yourself available. Now, John Wesley has a great prayer. And you know, as I read this prayer so many times, I've decided it's a prayer of availability. It's a prayer that he had the early Methodists pray to simply, like John Wimber said, Lord, I'm just nothing but change in your pocket, but God, please spend me however you want. I want us to pray this prayer as we close and take communion together. Are you ready? Let's pray. I'm no longer my own, but yours. Use me as you choose. Place me alongside whoever you choose. Put me to doing and put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Or let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and with my whole heart yield all things to your pleasure and purposes. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. On that night when Jesus was betrayed, the night of the Passover as he gathered his disciples in that upper room, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take that bread now and feast upon the grace of God. Likewise, that night, he blessed a cup of wine. And he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of many. This is the blood of the new covenant. Take and drink and do this often in remembrance of me.
Lord, I pray now that as we take the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, that we would appropriate, appropriate his broken body for our healing. Listen, if you're hurting, if you're sick, if you're ill, if you're suffering, just know that he suffered for us. The Bible says by his stripes, we are healed. So appropriate that in the name of Jesus. I'm healed. I'm strengthened. I'm encouraged. I can do this. And appropriate the blood of Christ, which forgives us of all sins. All sins, not just the sins we've committed, but those sins that of what they call omission. It means God told us to do something. We didn't do it. All of our sins, all of our sinful thoughts, cleansed, pure by the precious blood of Jesus. And now that we we stand in the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. We can come boldly into the throne of grace in times of need. Oh, Lord, we do that. We thank you for forgiving us. We thank you for our new life in Jesus Christ. And God, I just pray that there's not one person watching this, listening, that hasn't given their heart and life to you through Jesus Christ. If you have not do it, done it, don't wait any longer. Your eternity depends on it. But it's not just heaven when you die. It begins now. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life abundant. It's the best life there is. Just ask Christians that you know. It be, uh, wouldn't want it any other way. Well, God bless you. Have a great, great week in Jesus Christ. Go be the hands and feet of Christ. Serve, knowing your shape, knowing that God designed you in this purpose. Walk in your spiritual gifts. Walk in your abilities and talents. Use them for God's glory. God bless you. Again, have a great week in Jesus Christ. Amen.